Well, according to this Wall Street Journal review of the Abrams Concerto premiere, the answer is no, it doesn't. The article is entitled, His Concerto Panders for Praise, and that raises an interesting point. There's a fine line between honoring the diverse musics of the past and using popular styles to fish for compliments. What's the difference between pandering and homage? Well, for me, I'm gonna uh, leave. No, no, no. <laughs> this is like, oh. <laughs> no, but, but this is this is such a, a good question it is. because the way I use popular styles of music is very much about expressing like the the, the kind of music that flows through my head at, at all times. I'm not trying to create a collage of these styles, but I'm actually trying to create a through line of music. A hundred years earlier. Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue faced much the same criticism as the Abrams Concerto from high-minded critics, who saw it as a loose collection of catchy tunes. The philosopher, social critic, and giant party pooper, Theodore Adorno, refers to Gershwin's hits as relying on harmonic recipes borrowed from the so-called Slavic melancholy of Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff. Doesn't sound so bad to me. As for the use of quotation in composition, well, that's regressive and infantile. Similarly, the review of the Abrams Concerto calls it formulaic and empty fun. This is not about, like, pastiche. I believe it, the, the, the underlying features that, that make musical language work, they absolutely bind different styles of music together. Teddy's grand teacher, Leonard Bernstein, would agree. A piece's content can draw on popular materials, but still achieve formal unity. And yet, Bernstein didn't actually think the Rhapsody in Blue rose to this standard. The Rhapsody in Blue is so sectional and choppy that you can cut it, interchange the sections, leave out half of it, play it backwards on the piano or the organ or the banjo or the kazoo. But as different as Adorno and Bernstein's aesthetics were, or for that matter, Teddy and his critics, they all more or less agree on what counts as a unified composition. As Adorno puts it, every detail derives its musical sense from the concrete totality of the piece which in turn, consists of the life relationship of the details and never of a mere enforcement of a musical scheme. The material that I, I developed at the very beginning, just like any hopefully great composer of the past, uh, unfolds as if the genetic information demanded the overall scope, right? It's like the macro is contained in the micro. Such art music, for lack of a better term, is autonomous, indivisible, self-generating, like an organism that isn't so easily dismembered into TV jingles and movie soundtracks. In the 20th century, if you were to do something so vulgar as, I don't know, write a piece that people actually liked, there would always be critics waiting to unleash their arsenal of verbal artillery. Trite, feeble, conventional, sentimental, vapid, Fussy, futile, lifeless, derivative, stale, inexpressive. Man, the Rhapsody in Blue must really suck. Rachmaninoff knew this all too well, having been haunted by the popularity of his C-sharp minor prelude for his entire adult life. This is something that, as you'd expect, has bothered popular musicians for decades. For example, a young Mick Jagger once claimed that he'd rather be dead than still be playing Satisfaction into his 40s. Similarly, Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto may have cured his writer's block and saved his composing career, but it also became in some ways too popular for his own good. Themes from every movement have been turned into popular ballads, from Frank Sinatra, Full to Eric Carmen. Nobody's home. Or if you're a millennial like me, Celine Dion. Meanwhile, Hollywood found in Rock 2 both love. and lust. Rachmaninoff. The second piano concerto. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't ever stop. Why did you stop? Rachmaninoff was said to have 
hit the very center of everyday Philistine musical taste. Adorno pointed out that this was becoming true of all concert music. Adorno wrote, the man who in the subway triumphantly whistles loudly the theme of the finale of Brahms' first symphony is already primarily involved with its debris. Only the rather unmelodious 12-tone music of Arnold Schoenberg had the chance to avoid the prison cell of Tin Pan Alley and radio. Yet Schoenberg himself looked forward to the day that, quote, even male boys will whistle his tunes. Schoenberg had this to say about his tennis buddy Gershwin. Many musicians do not consider George Gershwin a serious composer, but they are only serious on account of a perfect lack of humor and soul. A real composer does not ask whether his products will please the experts of serious arts. He only feels he has something to say and says it. In their own different ways, Rachmaninoff, Gershwin, and yes, even Schoenberg were romantics at heart, grappling with the cultural and ideological pressures of the modern age. Rachmaninoff called himself, quote, a ghost wandering in a world made alien. Yet in the quarter century between his third concerto and Paganini Rhapsody, Rachmaninoff explored more dissonant harmonies and complex forms. Not exactly something you can whistle in the subway. It wasn't until the 18th variation of the Paganini Rhapsody that Rachmaninoff finally gave in, telling his friend Horowitz that, quote, I wrote this one for my manager. I heard Rachmaninoff said, this melody probably will save the piece. <laughs> Not bad, Mr. Connors. You say this is your first lesson? Yes, but my father was a piano mover, so.